we last left Alexander Berkman, he had been tackled by a crowd after twice stabbing Henry Clay Frick. If you recall, he was hustled down the elevator and put in the back of a police wagon while an angry mob chanted that he should be hung from the light posts. By the time that wagon got him to the station, though, he had regained the composure that he must have thought was appropriate for a revolutionary. Here's how the Pittsburgh Dispatch described how he looked while he was getting his mugshot taken. Quote, His cool indifference was remarkable. The photographer took six negatives, requiring probably ten minutes sitting and several changes of position. But Berkman maintained his composure throughout, looking fearlessly into the eyes of those who were watching, and even smiling in a cynical sort of way at the attention he was receiving. End quote. In his mind, Berkman must have still been thinking of himself as a hero, but that fantasy was about to come up against cold reality. I'm Jeff Grossman, and this is Across from Jericho, an activist history podcast. This season, we're talking about the famous, or infamous, anarchists Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman. In this episode, both Goldman and Berkman get sent to prison, but under very different circumstances. When Berkman got to the holding cells awaiting trial, the other inmates there didn't think he was a savior, didn't think he was a hero, they didn't understand what he was doing. Instead of being rallied to the cause, they thought he was bizarre and maybe crazy. Here's how Berkman himself put it in his prison memoirs of an anarchist. I paced the floor in agitation over the conversation with my fellow prisoners. Why can't they understand the motives that prompted my act? Their manner of pitying condescension is aggravating. My attempted explanation they evidently considered a waste of effort. Not a striker myself, I could and should have had no interest in the struggle. The opinion seemed final with both the Negro and the white man. In the purpose of the act, they refused to see any significance, nothing beyond the mere physical effect. It would have been a good thing if Frick had died because he was bad. But it is lucky for me that he didn't die, they thought. For now, they can't hang me. My remark that the probable consequences to myself are not to be weighed in the scale against the welfare of the people, they had met with a smile of derision, suggestive of doubt as to my sanity. Just as a quick aside or a placeholder for the time being, your ear probably caught Berkman's language about the Negro and the white man. I definitely caught that when I read it. And just so you know, there's going to be a little bit more language like that from both Goldman and Berkman in this episode. In the next episode, we're going to look at whether or not they were racist, which I realize is a super important question. The only reason I'm holding off until the next episode is by then we'll have some more information to talk about, and I don't want to jump ahead in the story. In the meanwhile, though, I just want you to know that I'm aware of this issue and I'm not overlooking it. So there Berkman is in the holding cells, surrounded by these fellow prisoners who don't understand him and think he's a freak. But then he runs across somebody else who's sure to get it because he wasn't just another random prisoner. He was actually one of the Homestead Steelworkers. But that tall man, the Homestead Steelworker, whom the Negro pointed out to me, oh, he will understand. He is of the real people. My heart wells up in admiration of the man as I think of his his participation in the memorable struggle of Homestead. But even this guy doesn't react like Berkman thought he would. Abruptly, he ceases, a look of fear on his face. For a moment, he is lost in thought. Then he gives me a searching look and smiles at me. As we turn the corner of the walk, he whispers, Too bad you didn't kill him. Some business misunderstanding, eh? He adds aloud. Could he be serious, I wonder? Does he only pretend? He faces straight ahead and I am unable to see his expression. I begin the careful explanation I had prepared. Jack, it was for you, for your people, that I... Impatiently, angrily, he interrupts me. I'd better be careful not to talk that way in court, he warns me. If Frick should die, I'd hang myself with such gab. And it would only harm the steelworkers. They don't believe in killing. They respect the law. Of course, they had a right to defend their homes and families against unlawful invaders, but they welcomed the militia to Homestead. They showed their respect for authority. 
To be sure, Frick deserves to die. He is a murderer. But the mill workers will have nothing to do with anarchists. What did I want to kill him for, anyhow? I did not belong to the homestead men. It was none of my business. I had better not say anything about it in court or... The gong tolls. All in. I talked to Nolan Bennett, a professor of democracy and justice studies at the University of Wisconsin at Green Bay. He's made a professional study of prison memoirs of an anarchist. So I asked him, what should we make of Berkman's fantasy coming up against reality? And this is what he said. This is not a problem unique to Berkman, though it did seem to be a particular issue in the late 19th century. These kind of reductively, we would say like martyr politics, these various movements for whom this great act of will that potentially leads to sacrifice, it's either the sacrifice or someone you're assassinating of yourself, what have you, is going to somehow magically compel not just a group of people, but the masses the people writ large, you know, Berkman talks about, it's the people calling he sees in Homestead. And the, the fact is, they don't ever work. They don't spontaneously summon mass action to your cause. Berkman immediately encounters a whole cast of characters in the jail, some of which are strikers who were there in Homestead too, who denounce him, who repudiate, who think that it must have been some personal grievance he had with Henry Clay Frick, who had overseen the, the retaliation against the strike. And to Berkman's credit, he writes the prison memoirs as though he kind of has realized in that moment that something has to change in how he thinks about political action. I don't think it ever leads him to repudiate violence fully, but he does there, and Goldman too, realize it can't just be what was called the propaganda of the deed or the attentat. It can't just be this kind of singular act of political will that strikes against a symbolic figure whose death then summons forward a new revolution. This just isn't going to, this just isn't going to happen. Bergman's immediate problem was that he was facing imminent trial for attempted murder. He decides that in order to stay true to his anarchist principles, he's not going to have a lawyer and instead he's going to represent himself. Emma Goldman, back home in New York, is not wild about this decision. I was considerably alarmed about his decision to represent his own case. I loved his beautiful consistency, but I knew that his English, like my own, was too poor to be effective in court. I feared he would have no chance. But Sasha's wish, now more than ever, was sacred to me and I consoled myself with the hope that he would have a public trial, that I could have his speech translated, and that we might give the whole proceedings countrywide publicity. Looking at it in the light of history, Professor Bennett comes out in pretty much the same place Goldman did. <laughs> I agree. The passages in Berkman's own autobiography where he is retelling the story of the trial as this great act of persecution. It's beautiful. It's romantic. I love the strength of will. But it's also incredibly frustrating to read it, knowing, and this is true even today, but especially at that time, the structures are all against you, Berkman, as his comrades did. You need to play the game somehow in the interest of pursuing your radical goals. You cannot merely just give this up for the courtroom and its jury are not an abstract representation of the public realm where you can kind of convince people by the just the strength of your conviction. No, it's a battlefield. It's a representation of state power. And it can be agonizing reading and, and thinking through those strategies. And of course, that's something where arguably, whether they be anarchists or others on the left, Activists get a lot better at that throughout the 20th century at, at developing their own legal apparatus to respond to state actors coming after them. In his opening statement, Berkman himself tried to explain his reasoning to the jury. Here's how he summarizes it in his memoirs. I address myself to the people, I begin. Some may wonder why I have declined a legal defense. My reasons are twofold. In the first place, I am an anarchist. I do not believe in man-made law designed to enslave and oppress humanity. Secondly, 
An extraordinary phenomenon like an attentat cannot be measured by the narrow standards of legality. It requires a view of the social background to be adequately understood. A lawyer would try to defend or palliate my act from the standpoint of law. Yet the real question at issue is not a defense of myself, but rather the explanation of the deed. It is mistaken to believe me on trial. The actual defendant is society, the system of injustice, of the organized exploitation of the people. He tried to read to the jury a whole long speech he had prepared, but not surprisingly, the judge was neither impressed nor interested and didn't have any patience for it. We have heard enough, the judge interrupts. I have not read a third of my paper, I cry in consternation. It will do. I have declined the services of an attorney to get time to... We will allow you five more minutes. But I can't explain in such a short time. I have the right to be heard. We'll teach you differently. I am ordered from the witness chair. Several jurymen leave their seats, but the district attorney hurries forward and whispers to them. They remain in the jury box. The room is hushed as the judge rises. Have you anything to say why sentence should not be passed upon you? You would not let me speak, I reply. Your justice is a farce. Silence! In a daze, I heard the droning voice from the bench. Hurriedly, the guards lead me from the courtroom. The judge was easy on you, the warden jeers. Twenty-two years, pretty stiff, eh? Meanwhile, back in New York, the NYPD didn't arrest Goldman, but they were making her life generally difficult. They raided her apartment and confiscated a whole bunch of her anarchist literature. After that, her roommate Pepe decided, understandably enough, that she didn't feel like living with Goldman anymore. Pepe had the door lock changed while Goldman was out at a late night meeting, forcing Goldman to go live with her grandmother for a while. Goldman didn't really love the idea of living with her grandmother on a long term basis, and one night she walked by an apartment building with a sign that said room for rent. She jumped on it, but that didn't really work out as planned either. In the evening, I discovered that the whole house was tenanted by girls. I paid no attention at first, being busy putting my belongings in order. Weeks had passed since I had unpacked my clothes and books. It was such a comforting sensation to be able to take a scrub, to lie down on a clean bed. I retired early, but was awakened at night by someone knocking on my door. Who is it? I called, still heavy with sleep. Say, Viola, ain't you gonna let me in? I've been knocking for twenty minutes. What the hell is up? You said I could come over tonight. You're in the wrong place, mister, I replied. I'm not Viola. Similar episodes happened every night for some time. Men called for Annette, for Mildred, for Clothilde. It finally dawned on me that I was living in a brothel. To make matters worse, while all this was going on, Goldman's sort of icy relationship with their ex, Johann Most, turned into an outright battle. That started when Most publicly spoke out against Berkman and essentially called him an idiot. Not surprisingly, Goldman was furious about this. Here's Professor Tom Goyens of Salisbury University. Yes, in one level, it sort of played out in the press. Most writes an op-ed in his own try height, basically saying this was a foolish act, not just by Berkman, but in general. This is not what we ought to be doing in the United States. He writes his op-ed where there's a clear connection to, look, this is different. This is not Russia. This is not even Germany. We can't advance our cause by doing this sort of assassination, this individual form. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to break into this office and just shoot this guy. And then the idea, you know, presumably is that all the workers are going to rise up because this is a deed that has the power of propaganda. I'll get in trouble for it. I'll sacrifice, but it's going to show it's a little bit like John Brown. He thought he could do a small spark 
but it would have this massive consequence. It would be a mass rising. And of course, it didn't happen. So that is most op-ed. He says, this is foolish. And yes, it does generate a reaction, first by people who saying, wait, are you changing your view? Because for the last 10 years, you've really been saying, arming the workers, which is slightly different than assassination, right? But it was kind of a motif there in your speeches that, hey, when it comes to it, we, we may have to do this kind of political assassination. The, the, the rules of the world do it. Why not us? So there was that reaction. Like, where does this come from? Are you you're now changing? Are you becoming, you know, less of an anarchist? There was a more personal reason for most anger, too. If you remember, most published a newspaper that Goldman and Berkman had worked for called the Freiheit. There was another rival anarchist newspaper called The Autonomy, published by a guy named Josef Poikert. Most considered Poikert to be a personal enemy and couldn't stand that Goldman and Berkman had started spending time with him instead. Johann Most could not stand Josef Poikert. And I'm not just saying ideologically. The two men, I think there was a hatred there, especially from Most towards Poikert. And that has to do because Most believed, I think deeply, that Poikert somehow betrayed a good friend of Most back in the European days. Now, we, we, that is a separate thing. I, I think Poikert later was pronounced innocent. Most just could not let it go. Most was a stubborn man, very stubborn. And here is Most, this is before Haymarket, seeing his two protégés. In his view, brilliant young men and, and a woman, Emma Goldman, Alexander Berg, great talent. They're going over to the enemy, not the capitalist, but this rival anarchist. And again, Goldman is also stubborn, saying, I do what I want. With all this going on, Goldman had to go out to Chicago and St. Louis and figured on the way back she would stop in Pittsburgh and visit Berkman for the first time in prison. Instead of telling the prison authorities who she was, she said she was Berkman's sister and gave her name as Mrs. Niederman. She and Berkman were allowed to talk for 20 minutes, and she was planning on coming back the next day, but in the meanwhile, a guard figured out who she really was. Not only did the authorities cancel the second meeting, they banned her from visiting ever again. When Goldman got back home, the battle with most was raging worse than ever, and in December 1892, she brought it to a fairly shocking head in front of a large audience. So that is all going on, and then there is a meeting called in December, a public meeting by the important group of the Yiddish-speaking movement who are somewhat siding with Most. And it's at that meeting when the president who leads the meeting is saying, well, we, can, we are now going to hear from Herr Most. So Most goes on stage. And here, I think, is where Most could have been more sensitive. But see, we're dealing with people with stubborn temperaments, high strung. So Moss proceeds to talk about this whole incident, and he sort of lets out that this act was foolish, we shouldn't be doing this, but then he, it becomes personal. He singles out Berkman and throws kind of a doubt on Berkman's motives. So this is a different thing. It's one thing to say, hey, as an anarchist, and I've, uh, I'm an editor of a really well-known paper, I'm going to be publicly coming out I don't like these tactics, whoever is doing it. But at that meeting, Moss says, I, I'm not sure why Bergman really did this. Maybe he wanted some attention for himself. And it's at that moment, presumably, I mean, there are lots of eyewitnesses that Goldman stands up, comes up on the stage and horsewhips him across the face. And so all pandemonium breaks up. Most of the people there are Yiddish comrades who cannot believe this impertinent younger activist dares to do this physical violence. And so she is kind of escorted. She's there with some other people out of the meeting hall. And of course, it gets sensationalized. Usually these anarchist meetings, there's usually a few undercover agents in the back there kind of listening. So there's personal dynamics. There is generational dynamics. 
there are ideological dynamics in terms of the autonomists. And just, you know, must, I think he changed, but he can't get himself to say to his audience, hey, I've kind of changed my views on a few things. After that, things actually calmed down for a bit, and everything was going relatively smoothly for about six months or so. And then, in the summer of 1893, a huge wave of unemployment hit the city. If you're enjoying this episode, be sure to visit acrossfromjericho.com, where you can find links to all of our socials and a sign-up sheet for our email newsletter. And for just $3 a month, you can join our Patreon. Patrons will have access to a special monthly mini-episode, a monthly live group chat, and a monthly book discussion group. You can even help pick which books we read. These benefits might change as we figure out what works best, so if you have any suggestions, feel free to email me. My email is jeffgrossman at acrossfromjericho.com. Or email me about anything else. I'd love to hear from you. The Panic of 1893 was one of the worst economic crises in American history. According to the City University of New York, by the next year, the unemployment rate in New York State had climbed to something more than 35%. The morning of Monday, August 21st, 1893, started with commotion. About 10,000 men wandered the streets of the Lower East Side, looking for an assembly hall that would let them gather. After being turned away again and again, the owner of Covenant Hall on Orchard Street agreed to host them. He opened the doors, and the building soon filled to capacity with about 800 people. Right after he let them in, though, he went down the street and told the local police precinct what was going on. According to the New York World of that day, quote, Ostensibly, it was a meeting of the unemployed working men, and the hall was given to them for nothing for that purpose. A few moments after the meeting had been called to order, however, the temper of those present asserted itself, and it became an anarchist meeting, pure and simple. End quote. The Sun also had a reporter there. And, by the way, most of the details I'm going to give you about the day came from the Sun, unless I let you know otherwise. They reported, quote, The proprietor announced that he would give a free lunch with beer. The thirsty were more numerous than the hungry, and the beer disappeared in pailfuls until the visible supply gave out. Over the door was a small American flag, which someone had turned upside down. Policeman Ornberg ordered it to be taken down. Later it was stuck up again in a hole in the wall in the same position, and the policeman took it down himself. End quote. Then, quote, Emma Goldman came in bareheaded and was escorted to the table in great shape. Two policemen in plain clothes dropped in to hear what she had to say. She got up on the table and spoke with great energy, her remarks being taken down by a detective, which tickled her very much. End quote. That evening, after a series of speeches, hundreds of people collected in the streets of the Lower East Side again and marched en masse up to Union Square, where the speeches continued. There are multiple news accounts of what happened, and they're all different in the exact details, but the same in general gist. The Sun estimates that there were about 2,500 people in the crowd, including an unknown number of plainclothes detectives, and then about 800 NYPD officers standing by at the ready. Then came the main event. Quote, The crowd was worked up. They cheered and yelled and pushed. Emma Goldman saw that it was a good time to speak. It had been passed from mouth to mouth that Krauf and Timmerman were under arrest on the stand, and that Emma Goldman, too, would be arrested. The woman elbowed her way to the front. Five detectives and Inspector McLaughlin were close behind her. The crowd waited breathlessly. The woman looked down and then ran the fingers of her left hand through her hair and began. I want to say a few words, first in English, to all working men of this country. I want to tell you that pain and shame would come to great men like Jefferson, Wendell Phillips, and John Brown, who did so much for this so-called glorious country. If they could be here tonight and listen to you working people who have been forced to come together and cry for bread. It is a shame that the children of the rich live in ease while you and your wives struggle in misery, while your loved ones suffer in poverty. The wives and mistresses of the rich live with diamonds in luxury. You thought this was a free country. You thought you would be free here because there is no Tsar and no King. You thought yourselves free. 
You are worse than black slaves. The owners of black slaves were responsible for them. The bosses are not owners now. The capitalist takes your muscle, profits by your labor, and throws you out into the street, sick, suffering, and hungry when he needs you not. Americans, if you really are free citizens, go and fight with the others. Go ahead side by side with the foreigners. They, like you, are starving. Don't think that the poor foreign people have come to rob you. They suffer as you suffer. Their interests are your interests. It is a capitalistic press that has worked this misery. It is capital that has caused this suffering. The capitalistic system will stand no longer if you are fellow working men. Go out together in the streets to get bread. If you cannot get that bread peaceably, then take it by force. It is yours. You earned it. As in the time of black slavery, John Brown and Wendell Phillips rose to aid. So now you will find leaders able, strong and faithful. You cannot be respected by anyone if you do not act. You cannot be idle. You must act. Go out for bread. Let them know you are hungry. It is but true. You must act, I say. If it is not given to you, then take it. I say take it if they won't give it to you. That was all in English. And then she switched and gave the rest of the speech in German. Again, Every account of that speech that you read is somewhat different. That version came from the sun. Even in her memoirs, though, Goldman repeats the most important part. There she says that she said, quote, If they do not give you work, demand bread. If they deny you both, take bread. It is your sacred right. End quote. So importantly, nobody disputes that she said that. As soon as she was done speaking, she had to run away to escape the crowd. Here's how the Tribune described it. Quote, when the meeting had ended, Emma Goldman, accompanied by two friends, started to go away and struck out a course across the park. But the crowd had seen her and followed. Right at her heels came the crowd, numbering many hundreds and comprising a choice collection of the lowest, vilest ruffians in the city. Shouting, hooting, cheering, yelling and whistling, they ran after her, driving against her from time to time and irresistibly impelling her forward, as on the crest of a wave. Once she staggered and fell, and her friends dragged her from under the heels of the mob. Twice her hat was knocked off, and at last she walked or ran, bareheaded, dodging and twisting like a hare for a means of escape. At last, an uptown car came in sight. On it she jumped and rode away, the baffled crowd uttering a parting hoot of defiance. End quote. The son found Johann Most, and the comment he gave them can't be read as anything other than anti-Semitic. This is what he told the reporter. Quote, there are no more hungry or starving than you will find at any time. Because these people are Jews, there is a tremendous fuss made over it. Of course there are hungry people in plenty, but they are not all Jews. End quote. Ten days later, Goldman was arrested in Philadelphia, where she was about to give a speech, and sent back to New York on charges of incitement to riot. She was on the fence about whether to hire a lawyer or to follow Berkman's lead and try to represent herself, but then Berkman himself wrote her a letter and said she should have someone represent her. Not only that, a guy named A. Oki Hall offered to represent her for free. Hall wasn't just some guy off the street. He'd already been the New York County District Attorney and had served two terms as the mayor of New York City. So that sort of decided that question. Here's how Goldman described how the trial went. The star witness for the state was Detective Jacobs. He produced notes taken by him on the Union Square platform, as he claimed, and purporting to represent a verbatim account of my speech. He quoted me as urging revolution, violence, and bloodshed. Twelve persons who had been at the meeting and had heard me speak came forward to testify in my behalf. Every one of them stated that it would have been a physical impossibility to take notes at my meeting because of the overcrowding on the platform. 
Jacob's notes were submitted to a handwriting expert who declared that the writing was too regular to have been written in a standing position in a crowded place. But neither his testimony nor that of the witnesses for the defense availed against the statements of the detective. According to newspaper accounts in the Evening World, Jacobs and other prosecution witnesses said that during her speech at Union Square, Goldman told her supporters that they might have to defend themselves with sticks and stones. That's something that I didn't see in any of the accounts of her speech that I read. Personally, I'm convinced that they were lying under oath to make her speech seem more violent than it actually was. And I'm not the only one who thinks that. The reporter for The World basically called bullshit on both the cops and Goldman and said that their versions of the speech they testified about weren't actually what she said. Here's what the newspaper reporter wrote in his account of the trial. Quote, To add to the complication, neither of these alleged recitals of what she said are a bit like the stenographic report made of both speeches by a skilled reporter and published in The World, August 22nd. And this reporter is a master of his calling. His shorthand report of the speeches note the stub-nosed queen of anarchy as saying things not at all proper or regardful of the law, but not the things the police say she said, and not the things she says she said. End quote. Mayor Hall, in his closing summation for the defense, said it was, quote, a case pure and simple of police persecution based on Detective Jacobs's notes, which were not in existence until this case was made up. End quote. The jury, made up entirely of men, wound up finding her guilty. When it came time for a sentencing hearing, there were rumors going around of a plan to bomb both the judge and the prosecutor. Here's what Goldman said to a reporter about it. I shall say simply that I am innocent of any intent to violate the laws. There will be no demonstration. There will be no bomb throwing. All that is silly nonsense. I do not want to be rescued. I feel I have been convicted by a prejudiced jury for nothing more than the exercise of my right, the right of every citizen, to speak my thoughts freely. There is no truth in all of these stories of a plot so far as I am concerned. I shall receive my punishment without murmuring. A speech by me could do no good. It would only injure the cause. I shall, however... Reaffirm my belief in the doctrines of anarchy and the negation of all authority. Judge Randolph Martin wasn't sympathetic and gave her the maximum possible sentence, saying, You have been convicted of unlawful speech righteously and justly. Your language upon that occasion was such as to incite riot. You are above the average intelligence of woman and must have known what such language would lead to. Upon the witness stand, you publicly declared yourself an enemy of law and order. Such sentiments are fortunately held by few compared with the great majority of law-abiding people. We have laws here, and you and your adherents must be taught that those laws must be lived up to, must be enforced. It is unfortunate that it is necessary to punish such as you, but the law and order must be maintained. You are sentenced for the full term allowed by the law and you shall be confined in the penitentiary at hard labor for the term of one year. Two days later, she was sent to Blackwell's Island to serve her sentence. On next week's episode, Goldman, still in prison, learns how to help treat sex workers who are struggling with substance abuse issues, and Berkman develops a surprising relationship with another inmate. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe and to tell your friends. Check out acrossfromjericho.com for all sorts of good stuff like pictures, transcripts, show notes, and links to all of our socials. Across from Jericho is a Split River Media production, researched and narrated by me, Jeff Grossman. This episode starts Sarah Natacheni as Emma Goldman, Roy North as Alexander Berkman, and Nathan Repass as Judge Randolph B. Martin. Audio mixing and sound design by Scott Rosenthal. Logo and graphics by Mark Richard Smith. The website was designed by Alec Farrell, and the theme music is Yo Cool by Alexander Nakarada. Special thanks to Brad Jarman, Teresa Buchheister, the Emma Goldman Papers Public History Project, Karen J. Greenberg, and Ethan Nickturn. Dedicated to the memory of my dad, Richard Grossman. Copyright 2023 by Split River Media, LLC.